your computer or is the system here? Okay, everyone, I'm going to introduce our speaker today. She's our wonderful in-house wine expert, Dr. B. She is my advisor, and not only is she an expert in wine and sensory analysis and all things wine chemistry, but she's also the coolest advisor ever, <laughs> and I love her. So I feel so blessed to be one of her students, and y'all are going to feel like this is such an interesting topic and you're going to walk away wondering, wow, I didn't realize wine was so complicated, yet interesting in an art form, but a science. And she really helps explain it all. And I think with that, oh, she's also a lover of what is it? Oh, wine, of course, good food. I think karaoke. <laughs> she is so fun to do karaoke with, guys. Actually, you might not guess it. Um, and then... I keep forgetting her favorite other oh, Negroni. <laughs> That's what I keep and forgetting. The reason I mentioned it. Yes, <laughs> and Negroni. So I hope that y'all enjoy her talk and let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, today I'm not going to talk about wine. I'm going to talk about wine very little, minimally. Today I'm going to talk about sensory science and I'm going to talk about what it is or what it isn't. Um, and what it can do for us as researchers, as scientists, as people who work with food and flowers and fruits and beautiful things. Okay, and it's not working. Can we also check the, uh, the chat? I don't know if there are any comments that are, are people able to hear. Which screen am I supposed to show? Right there. The, the, one, the one beneath the on the left hand side, right there. And go ahead and show It's not going into okay. Yeah. All right, let's try again. So I'm gonna start with a definition of sensory science. Um, it is a scientific discipline. Yeah, I want to make that very clear. It's a scientific discipline that's used to evoke, measure analyze and interpret reactions to characteristics of food and materials as they are perceived by our senses of sight, touch, hearing, smell, and taste. And within this science, humans are used as measuring instruments. So what, every time we use um, human panelists, we consider that to be a, um, a, an instrument comparable to other laboratory instruments. And that matters. Yeah. What it isn't, so this could totally be uh, the name of a um, science paper there, influence of wine glass, glass size on the sensory properties of white wine. This is not how we would go about <laughs> evaluating that. So this sensory science isn't that. What is it though? It's a scientific discipline. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and that is an actual study. Armpit sniffers work for deodorant companies to determine the effectiveness of a deodorant in controlling sweat, uh, sweaty smells. It's true. There is a study. And there are studies using panelists looking at cat food, for example. So it's a very fun discipline indeed. But seriously speaking, um, sensory analysis, sensory science can help us, as I mentioned, and uh, food producers, um, <coughs> vegetable growers, fruit growers, um, so on and so forth. In our evaluations, of course, wine is there as well. And this is an example of an output from a sensory experiment. I'm trying to see where my, oh, the cursor is. Andrea, you're, your, Andre, yeah. your slides are not advancing. You're sharing the wrong screen. And also, it's not in the presenter mode, I think. It is on my end, so I'm going to try again. Do you see it now, the updated slide? Yes. OK, with the three different photos? Yes. OK. Yes. Yes. okay. Thank you. All right, so this is an output of a um, um, sensory science study, and this particular study uh, looked at edible flowers. 
and sensory evaluation of edible flowers. And this is a PCA, a principal component analysis. Um, we have our two main components that explain the variable. So we're looking at the variability of the data. We're looking at multiple uh, variables. And this is what one example of an output. And the, here we combine descriptors, sensory descriptors. So we can see salt intensity, chewiness, spiciness, smell intensity, sweet intensity. So the descriptors are in blue. And then the species are in red. And you can see how each species kind of correlates with certain descriptors. Yeah, we have the sweet intensity. The closest to that are the Taraxacum officinalis, officinalis species, Salvia, Dianthus, Robinia, um, and then bitter intensity, Chicorium, Peonia, Rosa canina is uh, very close to astringency. So it, it gives us an indication of the sensory profiles of these particular um, edible flowers. <laughs> and um, this particular sensory analysis was performed by the Italian National Organization of Fruit Tasters, composed of highly trained panelists that have been working since 2001 to promote and valorize sensory evaluation in the fruit sector. So they have, in Italy, the Italian National Organization of Fruit Tasters that do just that. They're highly trained individuals, they are trained for sensory evaluation, and they taste and evaluate fruit. Um, the training with this panel for edible flowers started in 2016, and the study was published in 2021. So five years of work. Um, maybe less, because sometimes it takes a while to publish the results, but still, lots of training there. So what kind of industries use sensory science? We have, of course, the food industry, um, beverages, wine, beer, spirits, etc. We have the cosmetic industry. So, for example, they might want to evaluate how a cream feels on your hands. Um, well, you know, how makeup applies, what the skin looks like, so on and so forth. So cosmetics. Automotive, automotive industry. And this is an image from a sensory study done with the automotive industry. So the panelists are asked to evaluate how a car feels. For example, do you know, sit down, is it comfortable? What does the fabric feel like or the leather? How does the grip on the steering wheel feels like? A lot of work is put into uh, signal clicking, you know, the sound that you hear and click, 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 click. A lot of work it goes into that and also into how the car door closes. You know, that sound it makes, the deeper it is, the more expensive the feel of the car. <laughs> they put a lot of thought and work into that. Clothing, tobacco, pharmaceuticals, perfumery, and of course, research in academia. People like us use sensory science quite a bit. But in the end, what we need to remember with sensory, why do we do all that? It's because in the end, it's the consumer that matters. In the end, we want our pro product, whatever it is, to reach the consumer, and we want the consumer to A, like it, B, want to buy it, C, be willing to pay for it, yeah? So it's the consumer that matters. So for that reason, it, within sensory science, there have been a lot of different approaches that have been created um, for the consumer to answer some of the questions that we might ask. So does the consumer perceive a difference? We came up with a new product, whatever it is. Is there a difference between our new product and the old product that we want to improve on, for example? Or we're trying to create something similar with the competition. They have a product that's super popular. Everybody buys it. We want to make one that's very close to that. We come up with a recipe, is it, are the products different? Are they the same? And within this little graph here, again, is there a pointer? Because my, this doesn't work. No. Okay, so the, the, the image up there, <laughs> evaluate the difference between samples. There are many different types of tests used to establish difference. So A or not A, you give the uh, evaluator a product. Is it an apple or is it Coke? You know, they have to taste it. Maybe they don't see it. Maybe somehow you disguise the, the identity of the product. Is it or isn't it? Is it an apple? Is it Coke? Is it something else? Um, then we have which one is A? You expose them to a product. Okay, here, this is Coke. Then you're going to have two more. Which one of the two presented is your A? 
then which one is stronger. So maybe you played with the intensity of aromas or you maybe may, you made some adjustments and one of them might be perceived as stronger in one characteristics, the duo trio test, which one is the same as the control. Um, so different types of tests, different tools to establish if there is a difference. So many times that is the very first question we ask with a sensory panel. Is there a difference? Because if there isn't, there's no point in going any further than that. So that's usually the first step. And then if there is a difference, do consumers like it better or not? Because maybe they don't. Maybe we think we did something that's improving the sensory characteristics of the pro product, but in fact, it, they aren't, it isn't. And so for that kind of question, so hedonic and liking tests, we have these types of scales, liking scale. And there are many, many different types of liking scale. This is just one of them, the faces that indicate like or dislike or neutral. Or we have ranking exercises on the side there where you ask a consumer or a panelist to rank the products that you're presenting in order of their preference. Which one do you like best? Which one do you like the least? From one to three or one to five or whatever you have, depending on how many um, products you have. Those are hedonic tests. Then we have sensitivity tests. And sensitivity tests are very important why? Because we are different, we perceive things differently, and sometimes we need to understand how or at what level a certain compound affects our perception in that given product. So we have for sensitivity text, test, again, we have a lot of different um, tests. These are just two examples. So detection threshold tests, and within the det detection threshold tests, we have sub test. So what is det detection threshold? Anybody? What does that mean? Yeah? There has to be a certain amount present to be able to notice that it's there. Correct. So at what concentration of a compound in our given product, in our given so the matrix is very important. You have to apply it to whatever product you're working with. But you are correct. There is a certain minimum amount of, of compound that you have to have in order to elicit a response from the panelist, yeah? That's detection. A step above detection is recognition threshold. So, okay, I detect something into this. It's slightly different from the control, but I can't quite put my finger on it, what it is that I'm, that's different. At recognition tests, usually slightly higher concentration, you are able to identify what it is that's different. Oh, this tastes like coffee, or this tastes like bell pepper or whatever it is. Um, I gave the example of bell pepper because something that I work with uh, with wine and methoxypyrazines, and that's one descriptor that is commonly used um, in describing these type of compounds is bell pepper. So recognition threshold, I detect bell pepper. It's probably methoxypyrazines. And then we have the rejection threshold. And that's the quantity it takes for consumers to actually reject that product. Oh, this is horrible. This, is, this wine smells so much like bell peppers. I don't want to drink it. Right? Mm -hmm. That's rejection threshold. So these are all sensitivity tests that can be performed um, within the sensory science umbrella. And then we have anosmias. And what are anosmias? False, false false. Is that, are those false? False. No, false. Anosmia. Can't yeah, it's when you cannot smell a certain compound. And certain people are not able to smell certain compounds. They just don't smell them. You can expose them to them, the people to the smells all you want. They will not be able to perceive that particular smell. And it's important to test for these um, anosmias as a sensory scientist working with a panel because you want to make sure that the people on your panel are actually able to detect the compounds that are of interest to you, right? That you're working with. If they're not, then there's no point for them to be there. So those are called anosmias. And then we have descriptive tests. And those tests, yes, there's a difference. Yes, my panelists are able to detect these compounds. I talk about them, you know, perceive them. How are the pro products different? And this is where descriptive tests come in. And these are the most involved sensory um, projects. Usually it, they uh, involve training of a panel, 
long term with standards, with your products over time, they are lengthy and they are expensive. Um, but these are the type of types of tests that will give you the most detail about a product because they will describe it to you. What exactly it smells like, what exactly it tastes like, and how do the products compare? How are they different with characteristics? So those are descriptive tests. I'm coming back to the definition again, because I, again, I wanna highlight this human component and um, humans as instruments and why we have to be very careful in sensory science when working with human humans. Why? Because humans are very, very different in how they perceive things. We're all different from our sense of sight to our sense of hearing, to our sense of smell and taste. We perceive things very differently. And now I'm going to ask you to take your cell phones out and go to your um, texting app, SMS, please. Do you guys remember the dress? I'm not going to say what color it is, because <laughs> I don't know if you say, see it uh, the same color as I see it. But you remember, people see this dress as two different options usually. So I'm going to ask you to answer this question. So either text A or B. You have the instructions there. Text grape wine 747 to 22333, and then you will join. So text grade point seven four seven and then send it and then we send our answer. Yes, yeah, so you should get a re response back once you you texted that and then send either A or B. A being blue and black, B being gold and gray. So here's the dress again. All right. The majority is wrong. <laughs> All right. Everybody voted on that. <laughs> so, I mean, look at that. Quarter of us think that dress is gray, golden gray. Golden gray. Yeah. I personally see it as blue and black, but hey, you see it as golden gray, right? So there you go. How many of those are colorblind? Well? I don't know. I haven't done that test. <laughs> there is no right or wrong. Exactly. This is, we are different. We perceive things differently. There is no right or wrong. It's your perception, your experience. Nobody can invalidate that. Okay. So we've done the dress test. How about this one? Laurel, 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 Laurel. Same thing. You've already joined. Which name did you hear? A for Yanni, B for Laurel. <laughs> come on, friend. Come on. I did. You did already? Well, that was fast. I'm sorry. Oh, wow. Laurel. Oh, wow. Laurel. Oh, here's Laurel. <laughs> oh, my God, Abby. <laughs> we have a problem in the lab. Where are you going? Laurel. I can't understand why my boys don't follow my tricks. <laughs> Now I know why I'm misunderstood. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, our, 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 our. I did. Back, maybe. No way. Yeah. Yeah. The Andy back there. <laughs> <laughs> the Andy's got to stick together. Yeah. Hold up, black. It was it was blue and black. Yeah. Hey. All right. So now we're good. We're locked in for that one. Hey, that, that's pretty hard. That's pretty close. Okay, Cody. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so these are the final results. So now we're going to do a little detour and I'm going to ask you to do something. You have a little sample in front of you in the little plastic cup. It's wine. So if you don't drink wine, do not drink that. <laughs> For those of you who do, I'm going to ask you to smell it, first of all, before you taste it. Then put it in your mouth, swish it around as much as you can. If you can, draw some air through it and then swallow it. And then wait. Are you waiting for somebody to hurt? <laughs> We're not going to poison you. <laughs> swish it around, draw some air through it as much as you can. Come to our lab, we'll teach you. <laughs> All right. So maybe wait 10 more seconds. Wait, this one takes a while. Can you upload some wine to the, those of us? Don't mind? <laughs> I know, I know, but. I maybe you don't want this wine. I'm not sure. All right, so ta da <laughs> again, we are very different on how we perceive this one. And this is a sensitivity test that I recommend all winemakers do because this is a fairly common fault that we see in the winery. And there's a reason for the image with a girl, the wine, and a mouse on the glass, because this fault is called mousiness. So for those of you who can actually smell something or perceive something in the wine, it probably smells like corn chips. Um, it's also called mouse urine, or <laughs> uh, hence the name mousiness. So this is a problem in a winery? Yes. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? In the group. Yeah. So that we can find out who's people. Yeah. <laughs> people that said it smells a little bit different. Yeah. Does that mean they kind of perceive it? They kind of perceive really something, out? but it's not too bad. There's something there, but they there's something wrong. Yeah. But you don't exactly smell corn chips. No, it's just that what you're drinking. Or <laughs> so if you're a winemaker and if you cannot taste this thing, you're not going to know you, you have it, right? Which is a problem if you don't know you have a fault. So you need to make sure you have somebody in your winery or in your organization that can actually taste this thing, identify it, spot it, right? So you can fix it. There isn't any fixing for this one, just saying. So you can take some preventive measures maybe. So, but again, see how different we are in our perception of things. We're almost evenly divided 30, 30, 30 uh, in this one. Well, maybe a little bit, 40% um, say it's totally fine. Yeah. Not only are we different in how we perceive things, but our senses also influence each other. So sensory interaction, the, this is called sensory interaction, and that is the process by which our five senses work with and influence each other. And these interactions help us usually complete tasks, day-to-day -day tasks, like speaking and understanding a conversation. You see my mouth, you look at my face, you hear the sound, you put it all together, you have meaning to it. Same with smell and taste. And sight and taste also um, influence each other quite a bit. But I'm going to focus for this, the purpose of this, on smell and taste, because that's what I work with most often uh, with wines, although color does have an influence. So I'm going to quickly go over um, taste and smell and their interaction. So as we all know, there are five basic tastes out there, sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami. And we all developed sensitivity to, to these tastes for a reason. There's an evolutionary benefit for us being able to perceive these tastes, right? So sweetness has evolved to ensure adequate intake of carbohydrates for energy in the body. Yeah, fruits are sweet. 
Well, honey is sweet. It's going to give us energy. So we uh, need to find those sources of energy. Sourness has developed to prevent intake of toxic substances, but mostly to indicate ripeness. So whatever is not ripe is sour. It's not ready to be eaten. Wait, right? Saltiness to ensure adequate intake of salt and to regulate the amount of water in our body. We know that water, uh, salt retains water, so to regulate that in our body. Bitter is to prevent intake of poisonous substances into the body. Usually toxins are bitter, poisons are bitter, so we need to be aware if something is toxic or poisonous, so we can reject it. And then finally, umami, which is the taste elicited by um, meat broth or um, mushrooms. Those are very umami generating um, products. It's to make sure that we have an adequate intake of proteins for proper growth and maintenance of the body. So these are the reasons why we develop these, these tastes. People are born liking sweet things. It's born, it's, it's innate to all of us. And we tend to dislike bitter things as a general rule. And you know, all now kids reject bitter things and you have to expose them over and over and over again to train them. Sometimes they still reject bitter things and probably some of you don't like bitter stuff very much. Now smell, a little bit of a different story. We have five basic tastes. In comparison, we can perceive up to or more than 10,000 different smells, 10,000. That's a lot of smells that we can perceive. And we are also very, very sensitive to smell. For a taste to be elicited, it takes about, um, you know, in a range of micrograms to milligrams per liter of um, elicitor, so sugar or salt or acid to generate that taste. Compare that to nanograms per liter for smell, that's parts per trillion. And you can see we are way more sensitive to smell than we are to taste. And again, there's a reason for that. We need to be able to find sources of food from a distance or to stay away from danger or to find prey. So our sense of smell can direct us, you know, can guide us in that direction from a larger distance than our sense of taste. And I wanted to bring your attention to this part here. So how we perceive smell, there are two main pathways. We have the olfactory bulb, which is at the, in the skull there, kind of here. Um, and then usually we smell something through the nose and we perceive the aroma of that product. That's called orthonasal olfaction through the nose. And then if you put something in your mouth and you chew it, you will perceive an aroma through the back of the mouth that connects to the nose and the olfactory bulb, and that's called retronasal olfaction. So there are two pathways for olfaction. And many times that is important in wine evaluation, but really it's, imp it's important in all product um, evaluation when we do flavor. So we talked about smell, we talked about taste. Now the interaction between smell and taste is what? You combine smell with taste and you get flavor. Ta-da! Yes. So flavor is the sensory interaction of taste and aroma. And uh, that's, again, that's wine, but it would really apply to any kind of food product or beverage product. So the aroma of the product perceive, uh, can influence the perception of the taste and of the smell of that product. So detour, again, I need three volunteers here in front of the room to do a little test here. Three, please, come on. If you don't volunteer, I'm gonna volunteer you, so come on. <laughs> All righty. Oh, look, we... It's not a competition. It's always not a competition. <laughs> Oh, the men, come on, come on, ladies, really? Not one representative here. So I don't even know what it is either. Oh, we're on the same team? All right, so. Wait, I think I have an for actually. Okay, here's, this is what we're going to do. You just have a nose plug in your purse? Probably, because this is the wine lab. 
put our nose plugs on and then I'm going to take whatever I'm going to give you for to taste and I'm going to ask you to close your eyes taste it and say if you can identify it okay so I'll look cute we have to close our eyes. Uh, because yeah. I don't want no, to be oh I'll let you know when to close your eyes so Abby and Justin you're number one number two and number three wow. okay you're all going to get different okay so we are getting together all right so don't open your eyes, please. Yeah, not open. And please, the audience, you might smell this. Do not say what it is out loud. Okay. Abby, open. Or an alpha <laughs> <laughs> All right. We should have asked you to do it. Petal of a flower. Spinach leaf. Okay, Cody, I'm coming to you and I'm going to know. I'm going to uh, I have a little spoon and I'm going to feed you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here it comes. Wait, do we have it or I No. Nope. Oh, okay. All right, Cody, do you have any thoughts on what you just tasted? Really good. Baby, would I take the dropping cloth, please? Okay, here comes. Pepper. Here comes the last one. Open. There you go. Where are we? Shush. What is it? Tuna. What? Tuna. Tuna, yeah, maybe. Okay, so here we go, Abby and Justin again. Wait, and and this time you do it again, and then you take your uh, your nose thing off. And now I take it off. Let Justin do it. Yeah, so Justin, okay. go ahead. You know what it is. So special. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got that one. That's right. Okay, so. <laughs> take it off now just Do number one yeah that was basil <laughs> <laughs> no it really goes <laughs> all right Cody I'm coming to you uh, yeah you don't like vegetables <laughs> yeah you should not you should know this one really really well <laughs> take it off yep yeah the glass. Yeah. 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 That's definitely too. <laughs> You'll see the first time around. Good job, but give them a round of applause. All right, thank you. That's all. So pretty clear how our senses interact, right? We are very seldom able to identify. Good job, um, Nikolai there here, uh, trained uh, culinary person, right? Um, what we're tasting without um, the help of our smell. So smell and taste interaction important for our appreciation and identification of food. So now going back to the science part of the presentation, when we choose a sensory test to um, help us, we have some elements to consider. And um, some of these and very important ones are elimination of biases. So you don't want your panel, you don't want your testers to be biased in any way when they evaluate your product. So age and gender can be a bias unless you have a product specifically created for women or for kids for uh, age and gender can be um, a bias. 
older folk tend to have less acuity and less sensory perception. It decreases with age and females tend to be to have um, higher acuity and more sensitive to smells, but also female vary in their sensory perception with a month monthly cycle. So that, that's something to consider. Then you want to have a representative population of your sample, whatever consumers you are uh, developing your product for. You want to give as little information about the product as possible, usually. So for example, in our case with wine, we don't want to tell them, hey, this is a very expensive wine because they might think it's better because it's expensive. Um, on the opposite spectrum of that, if you want to see how price influences the perception of something, that then that's one piece of information that you want to give them to see if it makes a difference. You know, you give them the same wine, but you tell them that one is way more expensive than the other. Are they going to like the more expensive wine better than the other? And guess what? Do you think they are or not? Absolutely, yes. And they did some studies, them uh, functional MRI studies for wine and price. And they gave them same wine, different price points, told them some of them was super expensive, some of the wine was super expensive. And turns out that the activation is in the brain when the they told them the wine was super expensive, it's the same as for increased pleasure. So we don't just think we like something better, we actually like it better. We perceive it as being better. And that's something to think about because it can help in many different ways, especially with kids, um, I think. <laughs> Um, order of presentation is very important. You want to randomize that. People tend to like or to remember the last sample that was presented to them. So you want to randomize the order of presentation when you have consumers. And then we have adaptation and additive effects. And what ad does adaptation mean? If you are exposed to certain smells, you become adapted to them to the point where in the third sample, fourth sample, fifth sample, you don't perceive that smell anymore or you perceive it as being less intense. So that's something to keep in mind and to adapt. Um, and then additive effects in, with wine. One very easy example is tannins um, and astringency. You, we tend to see an additive effect. So from sample to sample, as we taste red wines that have tannins in them, um, that perception of astringency tends, tends to add on top of the previous one. And so usually we tend to perceive the last one be as being the most tannic wine of the of the group if we don't use palate cleansers, if we don't take breaks. So palate cleansers are very important for wine evaluation, but for all kinds of evaluation to make sure we get rid of whatever is in our mouth and uh, you know we're perceiving there so we can properly evaluate the next sample. Elimination of other sensory stimuli, so light, for example, or you don't want to be evaluating uh, wine and have somebody make coffee in the office next to you or grill a burger or whatnot, because for sure that's going to influence your perception of whatever product it is that you're evaluating. Um, testing your panelists, we talked about anosmias, so that's important. And then you're training your panelists, very important for the descriptive panels. And training, like I said, it takes a lot of time. Um, it's a tedious, uh, tedious process. Um, but it does create this panel that does function like a machine and you are able to calibrate it and generate very accurate, precise results if you do the training properly. So now let's see how can sensory science help us as scientists, right? Because that's um, the question. And this is one example. This is an example from my research. New method of acidifying wines using this enzyme is called glucose oxidase that transforms glucose into gluconic acid. Now I have low acid wines, we wanna increase the acidity, we put this enzyme in, and it turns out it does work, it does transform the glucose into gluconic acid. Now gluconic acid increases, acidity increases, pH drops, the enzyme works. I have beautiful results. Yeah, I have statistical differences everywhere. My pH, my TA, my glucose, my alcohol levels are lower. Yay, great. But how does gluconic acid influence the sensory profile of the wine that we're making? Does it make a difference? Is it a good difference? Is it a bad difference? What does it do? And so for this particular project, I used a method called flash profiling, which is a descriptive method. 
it is quicker than descriptive analysis and but simulate um, generates similar results. And this is an example of one result that I got. This is for color. Again, PCA kind of uh, type results. We have 81.8% of the variation explained by the two principal components. That's fantastic. And we can see how the color kind of separates along the two principal components. So ruby in uh, to the left, tawny and murky brown um, to the right. And then we see our treatments here. So the GOX, low GOX, high GOX are the enzyme treatments. And these are the control and this is the aeration. I'm not gonna go into detail anyways. You can see how the treatments correlate with ruby and cranberry and red color. As we go down, we see garnet and maroon on the, on the right side. Depends on how you look at it. On this side, um, we have the control and control plus aeration, and we see colors like tawny, rusty, brown, orange brown, burgundy. So clearly, these are different. The color is different. And these characters, the ruby and the red, are associated with a treatment, and the brown and the orangey and the rusty ones are associated with the control um, and the aeration. So that's information that for me is useful as a researcher to have yeah another example and this is totally off the top of my head and so don't shoot me if i'm saying something wrong but reading a disease resistant variety of tomatoes um, you come up with several new hybrids that are resistant to that particular disease they grow well in texas and you see some color changes in the fruit with these hybrids or some of the hybrids so now some sensory questions could be, do they, these hybrids have a different flavor profile? Do the different colors that you see matter in the consumer choice? Do consumers care about that or don't they? Do consumers like one better than the other? And some possible methods for, to answer these questions would be difference methods. So are the treatments different from the control? Yes or no? If they are, we can go one step further and use descriptive methods. What do they taste like, these new hybrids? What is their texture, texture like? And to answer these questions, we can use descriptive analysis or flash profiling. All uh, these are rate all that apply or hierarchical, hierarchical rating of all that apply. Abby there is my, that, that's what she's gonna work <laughs> with. So she's excited about that one. Uh, that's a very new method. And uh, yeah, we're excited to, to work with that one. And then, of course, consumer liking or consumer preference. Do the consumers like these new varieties? Do they prefer it, prefer them over the control or over each other? So you can you can go forward with an informed, uh, you know, being informed. You know, when you choose a method, there are some other considerations that you want to keep in mind. What is your goal? What are you trying to establish here? Are you trying to establish if there's a difference or are you trying to describe or are you trying to see if the consumers will pay or buy how much they will pay? That's possible goal, goals. How much time do you have? As I mentioned, descriptive analysis takes a very long time. The training itself takes a very long time depending on the number of products that you have, how complex they are. It can take months to properly train a panel. So if you don't have months, you might consider a different method like flash profiling, for example. How much product do you have? If you don't have enough product to train a panel for months to keep exposing the panel to your product for training and for the evaluation, then maybe you want to choose a method that requires less of your product. And how much money do you have? Uh, descriptive analysis is very expensive. Um, you have to pay your panelists. These are th th these are people coming to do a job. So you're hiring them as, as a worker and you have to pay them. Sometimes even with consumers pa consumer panels, um, you want to give a gift to your consumer for their participation. So that may add to your cost as well. So how much money do you have uh, makes a difference as well. It could be a contributing factor in how you choose your methods. And then finally, the final detour test, are you a super taster? There's some water and cups over there if you need them to clean your palate at this point. And then in front of you have a little plastic baggie with a strip of paper in it. I'm gonna invite you to take it out, put it in your tongue, close your mouth, 
and let your saliva kind of go over it and then answer this question. This water over there if you need it. This is the Okay. you do it again? We want to see the super taste in the audience. <laughs> Somebody said super. Yeah. So who who perceived this as being awfully bitter? Raise your hand. <laughs> awfully bitter. <laughs> all right, somewhere in the middle, some bitterness, but not a lot. And not bitter at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's a funky flavor. Yeah, not so much bitter, just a funky flavor. Mm -hmm. What was the compound? It's still there. Yeah, I'm going to tell you in a second. Well, I'm going to tell you. Are you better? So you might want to rinse your mouth after after this one because it can be quite intense. So again, we see 30% not bitter at all, 40%. Yeah, there's some bitterness in there. And then 30%, this is awfully bitter. And this um, is a test used to establish your taster status. You might have heard the super tasters and non-tasters. This is the test for it. And the compound that we use is called prop or prop, propyl thiouracil, prop, easier to say. And as you can see, we kind of fit the distribution there. 25% um, of the population is extremely sensitive to the taste. An equal proportion cannot taste it, and everybody else is somewhere in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> wow. There's a like old paper. Oh, so yeah. I got found a piece of paper in the hallway sitting there for a week. Not that I do that. What does it matter? <laughs> okay, I promise I'll be done in two minutes. Promise. And then we can talk. So why does why does this matter? Does it matter that I can taste prop and you can't? Big deal. It matters because it affects our preferences, food preferences, and our sensitivity cap capacity to taste food. Um, so super tasters tend to be more sensitive to taste in general, and there's a genetic component there, and also the fact that super tasters tend to have more uh, papillae on the tongue to perceive um, tastes in general. Non-tasters are less sensitive. So how does that affect our food choices? Well, if you're less sensitive to something, you're more likely to do this. Because you don't get that, st that stimulus doesn't really do much for you. So you might eat a whole jar of Nutella at once because it's not really that sweet to you or a whole jar of honey or very spicy foods or high alcohol beverages because they don't irritate you. Whereas if you are a super taster, you might shy away from these um, kind of stimuli, right? Because they're too much. I personally, I'm, I, I was tested and I'm super taster and I cannot deal with super sweet foods. I cannot. They're just too sweet for me. And then my son is like, oh, oh, oh. I, I don't know how he can do it. To me, it's just overstimulating and cloying and I, it's not pleasant, right? So there are health implications because of that. If you eat a lot of something, you might gain weight. You, it might be something unhealthy. You might eat a lot of sugar or a lot of fat or a lot of everything, a lot of salt. None of it is good for you. So now super tasters are supposed, because they're so sensitive to bitterness, um, you would think that they <laughs> reject bitter foods like broccoli or Brussels sprouts or black coffee or tonic water. Turns out not all do. These are some of my favorite things ever. As Cassie mentioned, Negroni is my favorite cocktail. It's bitter, bitter, bitter. And I like black coffee. So just a word of warning, 
<laughs> Just so you know. Ta da! <laughs> Turns out people who like bitter foods <laughs> um, are more likely to be psychopaths. What are you saying? <laughs> I'm not saying anything. I am not saying anything. <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Dead serious. <laughs> yes, I'm very serious. Um, now, I don't know how strong the correlation is, but I saw the title and I liked it because those are all my favorite things. So. <laughs> right. Conclusion. Sensory science is a science. Sensory science can give insights into aroma, taste, flavor, appearance of horticultural products. It can give insights into consumer attitudes towards product you are working, products you are working with. And many times sensory science answers the ultimate so what question. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you and open it up to discussion. Andre, I have a, a general question for you about yep. the future of the Texas wine industry. Oh boy. In, you, in your estimation, which of the following would be the better approach to have the wine industry advance? Number one, we elevate the skill of the winemakers. Number two, we increase the quality of the, the grapes that the winemakers have access to. Or number three, we do more marketing. I would say the easiest and the fastest one would be one, number one increase the skill from what I've seen seen so far, that would be the most effective approach right now to increase the quality of the grapes is, is absolutely desirable, but it's a long road. And that's the, like, like that's the long-term goal. The fastest one would be making better wine with what you have. Um, and a lot of winemakers in Texas make fabulous wines, excellent wines, but there are a bunch who don't and um, um, that would be really the fastest way to to improve the quality marketing that's a good question i mean in our situation marketing i i don't know where to place that it's it's definitely important is it the most important i don't know what do you think justin i think you can sell some really bad wine if you're a yeah. marketer well, yeah, but then how does that, if you go outside of the, of the state, Justin said that he thinks you can sell some really bad wine if you're a good marketer, and I agree. But long term, I don't know how that affects the image of your industry. And if you're going out of state, you you might not be as successful. I, I But that's a very good question, Dr. Leinberger. Thank you for that. Okay. Yeah, yes, that's cool. Yeah, um, uh, what about people that like sour but not bitter or sweet or not sour? Like one of those things, but not all of them. Does that have to do with in that sense of taste, or is that just something? Well, we're, we're so the question was what what about people who like one taste more than any other taste? Um, so sweet, for example, or sour or whatnot. I we are like I said, we are born liking sweet. Everybody likes sweet, and probably we like sweet better than any other taste out there. Um, I, I, I guess it's an interplay of sensitivity and experience. A lot of our culture shapes what we like and what we don't like. A lot of our childhood experiences and what we're exposed to shape what we like and we don't like. So it's, it's hard to give straightforward answer to that one. Do you like sour more than anything else usually, usually. yeah um i i don't know why <laughs> i cannot tell you exactly why i can think of a bunch of possible combinations of reasons why but not one straightforward answer yeah i don't have a real specific question other than covid hmm. in its impact is there any conclusion long term like uh, impacts on changes in people's sense of smell not that I know of. Uh, for, as far as I know right now, people tend to recover their sense of smell um, over time. Some of them recover it, but it's changed. It's not the same as it was before, um, but we're still going through it. And I think it's going to take a while until we understand exactly how this 
affects us. That was, for me, that was the scariest part of COVID, losing my sense of smell and taste. That was scary. Yes, Andy. I have a question about the sensory panel stuff. So mm -hmm. I've seen some really interesting research recently where they take sensory panel data and they combine, they combine that with like metabolome yeah. profiling. And then they feed that into a machine learning model where they can predict, um, where they can, you know, predict future products mm -hmm. based on their just metabolism profile. Mm -hmm. And so basically instead of training, training a, a panel, you're training a model to do the same work based on the panel. Right. And so I've seen that done in like blueberries and tomatoes and other crops mm -hmm. like that recently. Is there a place for that? Or is, is that even applicable in the wine industry? Because that's, it, it's such a unique, and there's sort of, I guess, I mean, I'm not a wine person, but there's, there's, when you read a label, you want to hear the notes mm -hmm. and, and the machine can't tell you notes, but it can tell you whether or not somebody is likely to perceive it in a good way or a bad way. But for sure, do you want to comment on well, that? I think so you said like, oh, the machine can't give you notes. It absolutely could give you notes. Because if you are looking at like the like a GCMS volatile profile, it can pick out the top peaks that correlate to the volatiles descriptors that we have. And it can mm. pop out and say, okay, the one of the highest peaks was linalu. Oh, well, this smells like like you're drifting through a field of violets mm -hmm. and you're skipping mm -hmm. through like you could it could totally crank out a label so then what is the future role of a panel once you can train a machine <laughs> to do that once you train a model then this you is a very a philosophical discussion <laughs> right now. hey i am machine learning and um i mean I don't know I hope there will be a, a place for panels because products keep changing and we keep changing we keep changing and our experiences keep changing and our expectations and what we're exposed to and many times we're influenced by marketing too we are told that we like something therefore we like it um, even though we didn't like it two months ago um, so I think there's there's a place for panels in the future how much of it well, it will be panels and how much of it will be machine remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It's it's a hard question to answer, really. Well, because you train a machine based on preference, but preference changes. Yeah. So you would have to continually you update. You have to update. Panels. Yeah, but probably so number wise panels might go down the number of panels, mm -hmm. but you would still have some mm -hmm. to keep things up to date. Yeah, Oscar. I have one related question then I have another one. Yeah. How big are those panels typically? Yeah, so a descriptive panel is usually about 12 to 20 people. You don't want it too big because just managing everybody mm -hmm. uh, can be a pain and expensive. Um, 12 is the most common number that I see that's, that generates enough statistical power okay. for you to have significant results there. Now, given the diversity of how we respond to flavors and what have you, how do people favor a particular product? How do people what? A producer for a particular product tailor that product to be a particular flavor. Okay, so the question was given the variability on how we perceive um, things, how do producers tailor a product for consumers? Mm -hmm. And I would say that they work with consumer clusters usually. Mm -hmm. So they subcategorize consumers um, in they like chunky salsa, they like spicy salsa, they like smooth salsa, they, and then they create products based on these clusters of consumers. You cannot go cover everybody. There's not one answer for everybody. Yeah. I'm gonna say, all right, everyone, if we wanna ask more questions, we can. We have cheese and crackers and sparkling water. And let's just thank Dr. Reese for such an interesting talk. <laughs> Thank you all online. See you <laughs> next time. Yeah, I just want to continue one discussion. Yeah. yeah. So, but I'm